Welcome back to Compounding Infinity, where we bridge the gap between the belief in the metaphysical and extraterrestrial. Today's episode is going to be a little different, but definitely needed. As you're most likely already aware, the goal of this channel is to educate about the different extraterrestrial races that have interacted with us and to take a good look at some of the knowledge and lessons they bring so that we can build a better understanding. I also want to demonstrate how metaphysical topics are not very separate from the subject, but deeply intertwined. Now, while education on books from channelers, contactees, and testimony from whistleblowers is important, I think it's also important to keep us up to date on current events, since a lot of the media I teach about on here is from some time ago. So in an attempt to keep us up to date, we will be doing our first deep dive episode. I want to make sure that we're well versed and informed on what's going on around us. And I'd like to show you that these events have been unfolding for quite some time. Now, with all that being said, let's do our first deep dive episode about the recent activations of the ARCs and discuss what that means for us. This update comes from Elena Danan via Thorhan Oredian. If you're not aware, Elena is a galactic emissary on behalf of the Galactic Federation of Worlds and writer of A Gift from the Stars, the title we'll be referencing heavily on this channel as the foundation of our research together. She has also written many other titles, which we will also be taking a look at later on. Thorhan is a Pleiadian pilot from the Galactic Federation of Worlds, who disseminates information to Elena in accordance with the Federation. In this episode, we'll take a look at what the arcs are, where I think they are, some of them, not all of course, and we will attempt to tie this information in with different titles and testimonies that I think might put these craft into better perspective. Hopefully this video will help educate you on these ancient craft, so let's begin. So first I'll start by linking the original announcement on her channel for your viewing pleasure, which I do recommend watching before continuing with this episode. She also has a follow-up video on the Ark on Venus, also known as Nara, from Jillian, who is the wife of Val Thor. Val Thor and Jillian are both featured in her book, We Will Never Let You Down, which we will also be taking a look at on this channel in the future. Michael Sala was able to corroborate this information through his military contacts and added an interesting layer of information we will also be referencing this episode. Here is a link to his video as well, which of course I recommend watching. These will also be linked in the description for you. One of the books we will be referencing in this episode is called The Ark by Ricardo Gonzalez. We will be covering this book in depth on this channel because it does tie in with our ET race for season one, the Telosi. My full review and analysis of this book will be forthcoming. As well, we'll be taking a look at some passages from the Emerald Tablets by Thoth the Atlantean and passages from The Only Planet of Choice by Phyllis V. Schlemmer, as well as testimony from former members of the secret government. We will be reviewing and analyzing both of these titles in season one, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss those. And of course, every piece of media I mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description. The first video we will go ahead and analyze is Elena's video with the initial announcement from Thorhan. This contact was made January 4th, 2022 via her implant. In this message, Thorhan announces to Elena that the ARCs have been activated with the arrival of the Intergalactic Confederation, who have also been referred to as the Cedars. If you would like more information on the Cedars, there will be links in the description box to Elena's Q&A about their return. Michael Sala's video on the Cedars, as well as his written article. I will summarize them for you here so that you have a general idea of who they are before we continue. The Cedars are a group of extraterrestrials, none of which originate from this galaxy, that experiment with different genetics to create new races to populate worlds. They do not create life, however, they do seed planets with these beings of modified genetics. They of course seeded this planet, and this is the reason why they are here to witness our victory over the malevolent invaders who have been here for so long. We will cover them more in the future as well, so stay tuned for that, of course. 
One of the titles we'll be covering here in this season that touches on the seeding of this planet is Talos Volume 1 by Aurelia Louise Jones. I'm looking forward to comparing this title with the other titles that talk about this event in history in a later video, just so that we can build a better understanding of this event. In this title, Aurelia references the first ancient colonies that arrived here when Earth was completely in the fifth density. Let's take a look at what this event looked like according to this title. About 4,500,000 years BC, Archangel Michael, with his band of blue flame angels and many beings from the light realm, with the blessings of Father and Mother God, escorted to this planet the first souls who were to become the seeds of the Lemurian race. This took place at the Royal Tetran Retreat, known today as Grand Teton National Park near Jackson, Wyoming. These new souls incarnating on this planet originally came from the land of Mu in the Dal universe. At that time, the earth expressed everywhere a perfection, abundance, and beauty that can hardly be imagined today. It was indeed the most magnificent paradise of this universe and of the whole of creation. This perfection was maintained for several million years until the beginning of the fall in consciousness that took place during the fourth golden age. Eventually, other races from Sirius, Alpha Centauri, the Pleiades, and a few other planets came and joined these seed souls to evolve here as well. These races mixed together to form the Lemurian civilization. To say the least, it was quite an amazing mixture. Lemuria, the motherland, became the cradle of an enlightened civilization on this planet, assisting in the eventual birth of many other civilizations, including Atlantis. So that is the description of the seeding of Lemuria taking rate from Talos Volume 1. As you can see, even though it wasn't the main focus of this title, she does go into a bit of detail about this event as told by Adama, a high priest of Talos. This topic in particular will be dealt with in more detail later this season, but for now, let's look at another title that references the seeding of Earth to get a better idea. The Only Planet of Choice by Phyllis V. Schlemmer explains these events as well. These messages are channeled from the Council of Nine. The multiple seedings of Earth are detailed, but unfortunately I haven't gotten a chance to read this title in its entirety yet. We will also look at a few passages just to get a better understanding for this episode, but we will look at this title in much more detail later on. Andrew. How was the first colonization carried out? Tom, a small number of beings arrived on Earth and they founded the first civilization. And when I say first civilization, that is not truly so, but they were the first arrival of peoples of ours and that was over 32,000 years BC. When did the culture of Mu begin? Tom, it was approximately the same time as Atlantis after the settlement of Atlantis and the developing of colonies and the treks outwards. You know that the peoples of the Philippines are descendants of Mu, as those who live on islands in music skirts. John, Polynesia? Guest, Bali? Tom, yes. Guest, and they eventually joined forces with the people of Altea and merged with them? Tom, they were from Altea originally, seated then by Ashan. Some of those in Atlantis were from Ashan. There were three seedings, yes. All right, so I hope looking at a few mentions of the seedings gives a little bit of context to these events. We'll of course be covering these events, books, and the seeders in a future deep dive episode. So if you like this one, make sure to leave a like so then know to do more in the future. There's definitely a lot more that goes into these events. There are many different races that colonize this world, as we saw, and I think you'll find these explanations of our diversity very interesting. So the Cedars have returned, and in doing so, have activated the Arcs. If you have read We Will Never Let You Down, or have watched any of Elena's Q&As, or even Cosmic Disclosure, you'll know that advanced races have conscious technology. 
Some of the whistleblowers we will reference have stated that some of the ships that they have studied are conscious, and this is confirmed in both A Gift from the Stars, We Will Never Let You Down, and The Ark Announcement by Thorhan. So with the close proximity of the Intergalactic Confederation's motherships, the consciousness within these arcs have been awakened. They are, of course, the owners of these ships, and their activations mark a new age for this planet. What are the Arcs exactly? The Arcs are ancient ships left behind by the Intergalactic Confederation, or Cedars. They are located on Earth, our Moon, Mars, and Venus. Thorhan does state that there was one on the fifth planet, but he did not say Jupiter. Why is that? To answer that question, let's take a look at the Genosians, whose description you can find on page 286 of A Gift from the Stars. These beings are also known as the Jedi Anunnakin, and are an exiled colony who left our solar system after their planet, which was called Janos, was pulverized by the Maitre, who are described as very violent and the worst of all of the many races featured in A Gift from the Stars. Janos was located between Mars and Jupiter. An entire planet being pulverized should have left some evidence behind, right? Well, let us not forget that this is the same location where the asteroid belt now resides. So, we can assume that with the destruction of this planet, that the Ark that resided there was also destroyed. But, I'll keep my eye out on if this was truly the case or not. Now, let's take a look at some of the texts that I think reference the Ark specifically. I'm positive there are more out there, however, these are the ones that I've read recently that I want to point out to you since we'll be covering them this season with the Telosi. The first text we'll go ahead and look at is the Emerald Tablets by Thoth the Atlantean. The version I will be referencing is the translation and interpretation by Doriel. So if you're not familiar with the being Thoth, he is described in this text as an Atlantean priest king who founded a colony in ancient Egypt right before the sinking of Atlantis. He was the builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza and ruled the ancient race of Egypt from 50,000 BC to 36,000 BC, bringing this civilization to a high degree of knowledge. Upon his departure, he erected the Great Pyramid over the entrance to the Great Halls of Amenti, placed his records there, and appointed guards for his secrets. Now, of course, we will cover this title in great detail this season, but let's take a look at some passages that I think might be relevant to this particular episode. Called he then, I Thoth before him, give me the commands for all I should do, saying, Take thou, O Thoth, all of your wisdom, take all your records, take all your magic. Go thou forth as a teacher of men, go thou forth preserving the records, until in time light grows among men. Light shall thou be all through the ages, hidden yet found by enlightened men. Over all earth give we ye power, Free thou to give or to take away. Gather thou now the sons of Atlantis. Take them and flee to the people of the rock caves. Fly to the land of the children of Kem. Then gathered I the sons of Atlantis. Into the spaceship I brought all my records, brought the records of sunken Atlantis. Fast fled we then on the wings of the morning, fled to the land of the children of Kem. There, by my power, I conquered and ruled them, raised I to light the children of Kem. Deep neath the rocks, I buried my spaceship, waiting the time when men might be free. Over the spaceship erected a marker in the form of a lion, yet like unto men. There neath the image rests yet my spaceship, forth to be brought when need shall rise. Know ye, O man, that far in the future invaders shall come from out the deep. Then awake, ye who have wisdom. Bring forth my ship and conquer with ease. Fascinating stuff, right? Elena mentioned in her communications with Thorhan that she knew that there was an ark in Egypt somewhere. Could this be the one that she's referring to? If you didn't know, Elena Danan was once an archeologist in Egypt. But I digress. Atlantis was one of the colonies that were settled by the Cedars. To get a better understanding, let's look again at a passage from The Only Planet of Choice. 
Andrew. The next myths that we hear about are those about the Atlantean civilization. Did it exist and how long did it last? We have a beginning presumably just after the Aksu period. Tom, we were waiting for when you would ask. I may explain, but briefly. Atlantis ended 11,000 years ago of your time and it began 32,000 years ago. What is called Atlantis was a colony which developed and with which we made contact. When I say we, I do not mean the Nine, but other civilizations. These civilizations translated technology. From there, other colonies went out, taking the knowledge and technology with them. At that time, because of the gravitational pull, not all the technology was refined enough in order for it to be functional on this planet. The time has now come when all this technology may be utilized. If you've watched the ARC video on NARA, these preparations are underway to make these technologies available to us. Now, let's take a look at a passage that I think will tie into what we read from the Emerald Tablets translation. Andrew, what was the principal means of transport that the Atlanteans used to get around the face of the planet? Did they just move around by sailboat and ship, or did they have aircraft? Tom, they had aircraft. They also could move in their body. Andrew, of great interest to me is the relationship between the remnants of the Atlantean culture. The high culture and the beginnings of the Egyptian Tom interrupts. Egypt was a colony that was very, we will use the term, hardcore. So as you can see, I couldn't help myself but to quote this title again. I think once I finish reading it, this title will be a huge point of reference for a lot of the research that we end up doing on this channel. I hope that these passages were helpful to look at so that we may get a better look at one of these arcs. Um, what leads me to believe that the craft mentioned in the Emerald Tablets is one of the arcs is the information given by Thorhan, which I will paraphrase. The arcs are filled with essential knowledge from these colonies and buried deep on these planets before the beings ultimately fled because of the wars with the Anunnaki. Now I know Thoth mentioned burying the ship before returning to the halls of Amenti, but could this have been around the time of the Anunnaki intervention? He states that he buries his ship and was awaiting the time where men might be free. He also of course mentions invaders coming from out the deep. Could these invaders be the Anunnaki? As stated in A Gift from the Stars, the Anunnaki come from the planet Nibiru, located in a parallel dimension. The portal they use to get here is located in the Orion Zone. So, I would think that this would be considered deep. Whoever these invaders are, the awakening of this craft would mean that we will be conquering with ease, as stated by Thoth himself. So imagine now the awakening of all of the arcs. Another interesting point I would like to address is that Thorhan states that no Federation rules are broken when we make these discoveries ourselves and unlock the knowledge. When I do my review on the arc by Ricardo Gonzalez, we hit on the fact that the Federation has strict rules for interaction. It's referenced many times in this book. We of course get a look at the Prime Directive in We Will Never Let You Down, and of course, we will cover this in more detail later as well. In her second video on the arcs, specifically the one on Nara, Venus, Jillian states that there are human scientists studying this arc in preparation for the arrival of the Cedars. So, I would say, we've been making a lot of progress in awakening this knowledge with the help of the Federation. So why now, you may ask? Well, the reptilians and the greys have been ejected from our planet and moon as well as this star system with the help of the Federation and the humans involved with the Earth Alliance within the secret military. Like Thorhan said, they could not risk this technology getting into the wrong hands. If you would like to read more about the liberation of this planet, I do recommend reading We Will Never Let You Down and watching the Q&As and updates on Elena Danan's channel as well as the updates on Michael Sala's page. What do these arcs look like? According to Thorhan, they are elongated, some being miles long. They contain crystalline technology that is used to transcend densities. This could be helpful when dealing with beings of different densities that all interact at once. 
or for the craft to transcend densities during travel. If you're having trouble understanding this concept, he mentions that these same crystalline technologies are used in their density belts. These were featured in We Will Never Let You Down, being worn by those traveling to places with different atmospheres and densities. So again, when applied to these arcs, I would assume it would allow the arcs to shift densities while traveling and may contribute to other interesting functions. If you've been keeping up with my reviews and episodes, you may already be aware that the Telosi use crystalline technology as well. This will be something that pops up a lot. As Thorhan says, there's a lot about crystals we do not yet understand. In fact, he states that the core engines of these ships are powered by crystals. Their time devices and pyramidal energy generators are made from crystals as well. So the next time you see someone on earth collecting crystals, it might not be a good idea to make fun of them. So we looked at one possible arc in Egypt. Do we know if any of the others were found? Well, as stated in the video and by Michael Sala, the Dark Fleet did find a ship under the ice in Antarctica. It was never able to be activated by them, however, and we'll be taking a look at this topic as well as more in the future. We will actually have a targeted disinformation about this very finding next week when we compare what Emery Smith said in Season 1, Episode 5 of Cosmic Disclosure to a movie that was released not too long ago called The Tomorrow War. Let's take a look at what he says in this episode and see if it compares to the information on the arcs. In this episode, Emery talks about a wide range of topics from hybrids to super soldier programs. He also states that the locations of some of the military bases were not completely arbitrary. In fact, some were built on top of ancient bases that were already established. Some of them even contained ET craft. They studied and reverse engineered these ancient bases in order to create new technology or to replicate what they found. He also states that a lot of these bases and other bases around the world fall on interesting grid lines that are associated with interesting phenomena. Let's take a look at some of the quotes from this episode. David, you're saying then that in certain cases, certain military bases might be built over erect extraterrestrial vehicles that's underground somewhere? Emery, absolutely. Or a base that was already there from ancient times from extraterrestrials that have abandoned it. D David, this does line up with some other intel that we got from other folks. So, are there certain cases where the craft itself would be very large? Like, unusually large? Emery, very large, absolutely. There's craft that are very, 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 very large that are stuck in the crust of our Earth. And I've seen the photos. We use a very special type of radar that is classified that has 400 times greater resolution than a CT scan. Some of these craft can be anywhere from 8 feet wide to 33 miles long. Some of the structures underneath the ground can be just as big, 10 times larger than the Giza pyramids. David, but are pyramids in some cases? Emery, right, yep, in that kind of shape. Or reverse pyramids, you know, tetrahedrons, one on top of the other going backwards. So very amazing shapes and very deep within the earth, with many things hidden inside them. David, so let's say we have, as one example, a 33 mile wide craft underground. How many staff might be dedicated to exploring just that one thing and for how long might that have been happening? Emery, it could take many, many, many years for that to, it's not like you break into a tomb and there's a mummy and everyone just pillages it. They're very careful with it. And just like in Antarctica, what's going on down there, it would take a team to properly research that kind of base. I'll say it's a craft underground, depending on how, there's many parameters, like how deep it is, what kind of rock is in it, how we're gonna get there. It could take 20, 50, or 100 years to do a project like that. David, I would be remiss to end this episode without asking this quickly, which would be, are you confirming the presence of at least one very large mothership under the ice in Antarctica? Emery, yes. David, we've got a lot of other testimony on this. You and I have actually never even spoken about that, so it's kind of amazing that you've heard about this as well. Emery, it won't be the people, you know, it won't be us exposing this. 
It's going to be Earth that exposes it because of the warmth. They can't fight the heat right now. And since they can't fight the heat, it's going to be really hard to explain when some of these snow melts next year and this giant thing just starts being exposed in different metal. So Gaia will be disclosure. Earth will be the one who exposes it. Isn't that beautiful? So obviously a lot to unpack here. Right off the bat, Emery talks about extraterrestrials having abandoned certain craft, which is exactly what happened with the Arks. They mention how some of the military bases have been built over these craft in order to study them. Could this be a clue to the location of some of these arcs? He then gets into the sizes of the craft, one being 33 miles long. Of course, in the message from Thorhan, he states that the arc in the Atlantic Ocean is the largest being miles long. I think this may be what Emery is referencing when he talks about this large craft. In this episode, he does talk about sub-oceanic bases, which further adds to my speculation. Then, of course, they get more into how long it would take to explore craft of this size. And in the full episode, he talks about how they would go about this, and I think it's fascinating. The answer is so specific that it makes me believe that they've been working on these craft for a while, just like the craft on Venus, which has been being worked on by Earth scientists for a year now. I also think the language that they use is very interesting. Emery mentions the Great Pyramid at Giza for a size reference, and David specifically calls the Ark in Antarctica a mothership. I think this is very purposeful on both of their behalves. Before we get into more of the analysis on this episode, let's look at that movie I mentioned a moment ago called The Tomorrow War. Of course, major spoilers if you plan to watch that title. Since I'll be doing a greater breakdown next week, I will just describe for you the plot of the movie. It starts with people watching a soccer game around the holidays when a large portal opens up on the field and humans from the future come through stating that there is a war in the future, that they are losing, and they need to start drafting people from the past. The war is with malevolent, bloodthirsty aliens, and if you're sighing and shaking your head at the mention of that, you are not alone. We'll get into why this plot is structured the way that it is next week, so stay with me here. They lose a significant part of the population. The main character, upon his return, is trying to figure out where they came from, and since they seem to have just appeared one day, they're not really sure. Well, with some very mild research, they are able to pinpoint where they emerged. Get where I'm going with this? They dug their way up from the ice, where their ship was frozen, and with global warming, they would eventually thaw and come up to wreak havoc. Now, of course, I will be analyzing the fear tactics used in this title, but I want us to focus on the fact that they specifically reference this arc in Antarctica. I'm of the opinion that this was done purposefully to scare us because the Cabal was well aware that these arcs would not stay hidden forever. I don't want to get too deep into this, though, so we'll save that for next week. So another interesting thing Emery mentions when addressing the length of time it would take to investigate a craft this large is what kind of rock is inside of it. When we look at Michael Sala's video, his insider comments that the arc he was investigating on the moon contains moldavite, which helped elevate consciousness. We will get into that video next, but I wanted to make that connection while we're focused on what Emery said this episode. When he gets into the other larger structures underground, I have no doubt that he's referencing Agartha. When we get to our Agartha episode this season, we will be taking a look at a lot of the underground voids and making some comparison to texts referencing Agartha. Even in the Emerald Tablets, Thoth states that the Giza Pyramid was built over the entrance to the Great Halls of Amenti. I have a theory that these halls are indeed Agartha, but we'll cover this later on as well. For now, I just want us to note the connection to some of these craft and the voids underground. The Pyramid of Giza being the most prolific. We'll get into this topic more when we analyze other episodes of Cosmic Disclosure, where the miles deep void under the Great Pyramid of Giza is referenced, but for now, let's analyze more of what was said about these craft in this episode. When Emery mentions the tetrahedron-shaped craft with two inverted pyramids placed over each other, I'm sure we all realize that he was referencing the Merkaba. I have a new series on the way where we will cover the Merkaba in detail, so make sure to stick around. 
if you're familiar with my content on other platforms, you've heard me talk about the Merkaba before. The Merkaba is the simplification of Metatron's cube and is used by beings like the Egoroth for travel. The Ohorai were pictured in front of a large Merkaba as well. So let's take a look. If you're not familiar, the Ohorai are found on page 94 of A Gift from the Stars and are from the Boots constellation where their planet orbits the star Arcturus. They are one of the most advanced civilizations in the galaxy and have ascended to the seventh and ninth densities. There are three groups, the Ohorai, the Glidei, and the New Lin. The Ohorai are the group that are involved with the Galactic Federation of Worlds concerning Earth. They have bases on Earth inside of mountains and in nearly every country. They also have three bases on the moon. Their ships are the finest in the entire galaxy, propelled by crystals conducting light energy from the source core of the galaxy. They are huge, spherical, and appear vibrant, bright, and very ethereal to us. Using these ships, they can travel through time as well. They also have small shuttlecraft that are also spherical that they use to shift magnetic points and grids on Earth in the process of helping the planet elevate to the 5D as soon as possible. This is interesting as well because if you watch the full episode, Emery talks about how some of these craft they have found correspond with the grid lines on Earth and he states that people have witnessed interesting phenomena in relation to these grids. There are some military bases that have been built over these grid lines and perhaps they could have been built there over those smaller craft of the Ohorai, maybe even the ones Emery mentioned being eight feet. On his show Initiation, Matthias Stefano states that some of the craft these beings use are Merkaba spinning so fast that it, they appear to us as orbs. Could this be the case with the Ohorai since Merkaba is shown with them? Let's take a look at the Egoroth before we move on. The Egoroth can be found on page 238 in A Gift from the Stars. There are two groups, the Egoroth and the Daron Egoroth. They are very wise, old, and are an ethereal race of beings. They are located in the Orion Zone and are part of the Council of Five. They can shift to the ninth density and are also involved with helping the ascension of Earth to the fifth dimension. They work with the Galactic Federation of Worlds, like the Ohorai. Their ships are geometrical shapes, such as diamond, lozenge, and Merkaba. The places Thorhan mentions there being arcs are Egypt, South America, Central Europe, Northwest of Russia, and the Atlantic Ocean, which is the largest. There are others, but he was not authorized to say, so that is for us to find out. So you may be asking, why are there so many here? Well, you have to remember that there were many colonies that came here from other galaxies to seed Earth. Like I mentioned earlier from the title, The Only Planet of Choice, it is stated that there were many seedings. I'm hoping that this quote from that same title puts into perspective why so many have occurred. That which was planned for the planet Earth did not come to pass. While it was discovered that, of all the planets in the universe, it has more beauty more diversification of changes than any other, it was also discovered that those that lived upon Earth had a great physicalness that was not witnessed on any other planets. Finally, Thorhan states that we will come to the full realization of our ancient origin and the knowledge of other civilizations among the stars this year, which means I'm on a tight schedule to get these episodes done so that you can have another place to start in your quest for no more knowledge. I will do my best to explain these events and titles in the best way possible so that you can understand and ask your own questions. It's going to be an interesting journey we embark on and I hope my input helps make the process go a little smoother. Now let's take a look at Michael Sala's video confirming the activation of the ARCs. In his video, he states that the ARCs are being explored in a joint US and China mission that are part of the broader Earth Alliance. For more information on the Earth Alliance, please reference We Will Never Let You Down and this video of Michael Sala, which details some of the events occurring with the Earth Alliance. 
I believe this is the same Alliance Emery references in the very epi first episode of Cosmic Disclosure. My review on that episode should be out shortly. Now we know that the Confederation is parked out near Jupiter and that this close proximity to the arcs are what activated them. In his interview with JP, who is an army insider, they detail how he visited one of the activated arcs on the moon as a military escort to the Earth Alliance. This craft was described as large, spherical, and was estimated to be about two aircraft carriers in size. It also had hieroglyphics on the inside. JP states that he was taken by humanoid ETs to a spherical structure in the past, which he described as arcs with ancient plants and animals inside. This was around 2014 through 2015. In Elena's interview with Jillian, who is Venusian and wife of Val Thor, she states that they warned us of the arrival of the Confederation and allowed Earth scientists to work on the Ark on Venus. This has been going on for a year now, and they are attempting to connect these Arcs to the energy grid on Earth in about one and a half to two years time. So hopefully this means that we are close to completion with at least some of the Arcs, but only time or an additional message will tell. As I mentioned earlier, JP stated that the arc on the moon contained Moldavite, which helped elevate consciousness. What exactly is Moldavite? Well, it is an olive green to forest green tektite, or more specifically, as stated in Wikipedia, a vitreous silica projectile glass formed by a meteorite impact that most likely occurred in southern Germany around 15 million years ago. In 1900, Franz Eduard Seuss attributed this material to a cosmic origin and regarded Moldavite as a special kind of meteorite and thus proposed the name Tektite. So far, Moldavite has been found in the Czech Republic, Germany, and Austria. Notice anything interesting about those countries? They're all in Central Europe, where one of the arcs is supposed to be. Could this impact have been one of the arcs? Maybe. Let's take a look at the Nordlinger Rise Crater which has been thought to be the site of the impact that created Moldavite in the first place. Did you know that the astronauts of Apollo 14 trained in this crater in order to be able to investigate similar impact craters on the moon? Hmm, conveniently, that is where the Ark with Moldavite inside of it resides. Eugene Cernan, one of the backup astronauts for Apollo 14, who also has a quote featured in the book, The Ark, by Ricardo Gonzalez, was also trained at this site. He is quoted in Chapter 3, Edgar Mitchell's Request. They have asked me regarding UFOs, and I have publicly stated that I think something else exists, some other civilization. Eugene Cernan, commander of Apollo 17, the last man to step on the moon, European Press, January 15th, 2007. At this point, this all can't be coincidence, right? Most likely not, since the Rise Crater is a Rampart Crater, which is a unique finding on Earth. In fact, Rampart Craters are almost always exclusively found on Mars, which is another location the Cedars left an arc, or arcs. Rampart Craters have fluidized ejecta flow after impact, which can be compared to a bullet fired into mud where the ejecta would resemble the mud flow. Now, we know that Moldavite was described by JP as being able to elevate consciousness, but what if it was used like the other crystals we've heard about inside of these ships to transcend densities? If it were, it would certainly make it very easy to bury a large ship underground since it could transcend the density of said ground. Could these tektites be the remnants of a buried ark in Central Europe? There is also another crater 24 miles or 42 kilometers west-southwest of the Rise Crater and was thought to have been created from the impact of a binary asteroid that would have created the Rise Crater as well. Interestingly too, on the edge of the Rise Crater, there are remains of underground car system called the Afnet Caves. These two caves became famous in 1908 when 33 prehistoric human skulls dated from the 7th millennium BC were found. The larger cave contained 27 skulls and the smaller cave contained six. 
They were covered in a thick layer of red ochre and were arranged concentrically with their heads facing the rising sun. Do we have another event like the one detailed in Unearthing Nazca, where non-terrestrial bodies were found covered in a fine powder in the caves of Peru? Could both of these places be connected to an underground network called Agartha? Now I know talking about this crater in Europe might get the gears turning here elsewhere on the planet, so I will leave you with this before we move on. Did you know, in 1909, the Arizona Gazette reported that archaeologists discovered traces of an ancient Tibetan or Egyptian civilization in an underground tunnel in the Grand Canyon? Hmm, we'll definitely be looking into this more in our Agartha series. I'd like to next compare the information found in the book named The Ark by Ricardo Gonzalez, an extraterrestrial warning from Alpha Centauri. What I'd like to talk about specifically is the premise of this book and how it may tie into the Ark activations. First, of course, we can notice the name of the book, but I would also like to point out that it centers mostly in South America, another location shared by Thorhan as being the location of another Ark. Let's get a small overview of the book then look into where this arc is supposed to be located. In this title, Ricardo Gonzalez has many encounters with beings called the Apunians. There are some from the future and some from this timeline, and they come to warn us about the path we are on now and how devastating it would be for us if we continue into that timeline. In fact, things get so bad in this scenario that the world's superpowers are forced to come together and send children into space in search of a new habitable world, much like an interstellar. This project is called the Ark. The technology that they use is called the Manias, something the Apunians are already very familiar with. That's just a very simplified overview of this book, but my review on this title is coming very soon, which will give you a better understanding of what's going on here. Hopefully by now, we have avoided this timeline with the help of the Federation and Earth Alliance. Now, there are a few things I want to reference from this title in regard to the arcs, so let's look at a quote from chapter 12 called Chaknantor. Chaknantor, in the local Kunza dialect, means the place of takeoff. Dr. Ana Maria Barron, Chilean archaeologist of the Atacama Desert. Now, Chaknantor is located in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. It is also home to the largest and most expensive astronomical telescope project in the world. The importance of this and how it ties into what the Apunians were warning us about, of course, is explained thoroughly in this title. But if you have a sharp ear and have been keeping up with many events going on in ufology, the Atacama should ring some bells for you. The Atacama Man, which is nicknamed Ada, is a small extraterrestrial body that was found in that very desert. This event is detailed in Cosmic Disclosure, Season 1, Episode 6, for those who are interested. In this episode, he talks about the city located under the pyramids at Giza, but he also talks about the vast underground city beneath the Nazca Lines, also located in the Atacama Desert. He states that there are a lot of craft down there, and David confirms from his source in the Alliance that there are five, and that they are so advanced that they have about two to three thousand people working on them. There are also beings in stasis located in this underground city, and of course, they reference the show Unearthing Nazca, which I highly recommend, where they find many ET bodies in the same area. They confirm this episode that the Alliance and SSP have full control over the tunnels, bodies, and the ships located there. They state in this episode as well that the craft are so advanced that they didn't know what to do with them or how to get into them. Perhaps this has changed now that the arcs have been activated. But I, be I believe this is the location Thorhan talks about when he references South America. So obviously there's a lot going on here, so let's go ahead and look at that quote from the arc that I think will tie into this very well. It became clear to me that Avika was part of their most recent arrival, a cosmic phenomenon that allowed them to come called by them the event. But the extraterrestrials of Alpha Centauri have already visited our world in remote times. In this sense, the information that the Apunians provided us about Huascaran and Yongle 2015 was accurate. The majestic snowy mountains in the Peruvian Andes had been the perfect setting to land their first laboratory ship. 
Now there are a lot of craft, maybe even some that haven't been discovered yet, but this particular area seems to be a hotbed for craft, landings, bodies, and much more. This is also a location of Agartha. Once we get into the official analysis, it will be interesting to see if there are any more connections that I can make about the arcs and this title. But I, but I think I've blabbered on long enough, so for time's sake, I will resist the urge to delve deeper. But I will say, I think it's very interesting that in a few of our examples, some of the caves and underground void, so-called Agartha, have been connected to these arcs. So we've covered all of the arcs Thorhan mentioned, right? Let's review. We talked about the many arcs in custody of the Earth Alliance in South America. We've covered a possible arc under the Rise Crater in Germany, where I believe covers at least one of the arcs in Central Europe. We definitely talked about a miles long arc that was mentioned in the same episode where Emery Smith talks about sub-oceanic bases, which covers the arc Thorhan states is the largest in the Atlantic Ocean. So that just leaves the arc in northwest of Russia. I have a hunch about this one too, but for that, you'll have to stay tuned for my targeted disinformation episode next week covering the Tomorrow War. I think the location of the ship in that movie may be able to point us in the direction of an arc in Russia. I won't leave you on a complete cliffy though, that would just be cruel. Let's just say I did a little digging and found an interesting shape in the ice in this Russian location that is consistent with the shape of the arc that was found under the ice in Antarctica. But I think this episode has gone on long enough, so I'll just leave that with you and hopefully see you next week for that full breakdown. So I hope this deep dive analysis was helpful in understanding the arcs, and I hope you had a good time analyzing some of the media that I think points us in the direction of where I think some of these arcs could be. Let me know if you agree down below, or if you have any other hunches about where some of the other arcs could be. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so that you can stay up to date. All of those links I mentioned earlier are there for you in the description box if you want to read along with me. And if you're looking for more people to subscribe to here on YouTube, make sure to give both Elena Danan and Michael Sala a follow as well if you haven't already. Thank you so much for joining me in this deep dive episode of The Arcs on Compounding Infinity. As always, I'm your host, Jade Lore. Until next time.